and um, let's talk about writing shell scripts today. All right, so uh, just before we do that, though, I'm going to show you how to manipulate uh, files um, from the command line. So I want to talk about uh, very quickly talk about moving, removing and copying files. All right, so let's see. So you know that um, at this point you should realize that files are pretty important. Well, they're basically fundamental to the way um, Linux or Unix works, right? So everything is um, information is stored as files on your file system. Uh, it's not unusual to want to move or rename files or delete files um, or things like that, right? So the command MV is short for move. Uh, that one, uh, that command moves or renames files. Uh, now, remember how files, uh, remember how file names are stored um, in Unix, right? Or Linux, right? Any Unix-like system, including Mac, right? So uh, the file names um, are not stored um, in the inode for a file. Right? So remember that inodes represent uh, inodes are the fundamental way that files, um, information about files are stored, uh, but the file name is not part of the inode, right? So instead, the file names are stored in um, another file called a directory, right? So a directory is just a file. And remember that directories are basically, uh, you can think of them as being two column files, a file with two columns, right? In the first column is the file name, in the second column is the inode that contains information about the file. Right, so what the move command does is it updates the directory file, right? So if you want to move a file, right, to uh, you want to rename a file, all move does is it changes the name, the file name in the directory file, right? So when you, if you have a file called some file, so let's make that file right now. So I'm going to touch. Some, there you can see there's a file called some file.txt. Right. If I want to rename that file, right, you just use the move command. So MV, and then the name of the file that you want to rename. So that's some file, right? Uh, and then the name, uh, its new name. So renamed. Is that the example I'm using? Renamed file.txt. And then when you uh, list the contents of the directory, you see that there is a file called renamed file. Right, and there is no file called subfile.txt. Right now, remember what? The, uh, so remember how that's accomplished. Right, all that happens is that in the directory file, uh, uh, you um, the string subfile.txt. Right, so the file name subfile.txt just gets changed to renamed file.txt. So that's all that happens. Uh, you can move a file to another directory. Right, so how does that work? Well, if you want to move a file from one directory to another. Right, you remove the file, uh, the file name and its inode from one directory file, and you insert it into the destination directory file. Right, uh, so you use the move command to do that. Let's see. Uh, I want to. So in this example here, again, I'm going to have a file called some file.txt. Right, uh, I'm going to make a directory called sumdir, and then I'm going to move some file.txt into some dir. Right, so let me re let me move renamed back to some file.txt. There again, you can see some file.txt. Right now I want to move it into a directory somewhere. Um, all these blue directories, all these blue uh, names here, these are all directory names. I guess I'll just stick with the example. So I'm going to make another directory called some dir, which is right there. Right now, I want to move this file from the current directory into that directory. Right, so I just move uh, some file.txt into some, sorry, into some dir. Right, press enter. Some file.txt is no longer here. Um, but if I list the contents of some dir, some file.txt is now there. Right, so the move command takes in a file. And then a destination, right? The destination can be another file name or it can be uh, a directory. So in the previous example, right? Source, destination. So the destination is another file name, so it renames the file. 
if the destination is another directory, it just moves the file into that directory. Right. Um, some files, so I have two files here. Okay, uh, now you can pass in a bunch of files and move them all to the same directory. So I'm going to move uh, some file back here, right? So that's going to move uh, the file, some file.txt that's in some dir. Dot is the current directory, so it's going to move it back into this directory. For some file.txt. Oh, it's some file one. Okay, so I'm going to move some file to some file one. Then I'm going to make another uh, file, some file two.txt. So I can move both of these files into some dir. And both the files are gone. And if you look in some dir, you can see both files there. Now there's another way to do this. Well, there's actually several ways to do this. So let me move both of those files back to here, right? So I can use a wildcard. Uh, sorry, I can use a path name expansion here. So I can do some file star, right? So that'll move, uh, and I can move them to here, right? Now remember what the star does, right? So it expands to um, anything that starts with some file, right? Uh, uh, followed by anything else, right? So anything that starts, uh, so some file star expands to some file followed by anything. Right? So when I type this command in, this is the same thing as typing move, some or some file, one dot text some dir some file two dot text dot right that will move everything back to here so there they are now if i want to move both of those files back into some dir right you can use the star right you can use the question mark and then do dot txt right that also works right so what is this how does uh, this work? So that's, again, that's another path name expansion, right? That matches any single character. So that's the same thing as typing move some file one dot text, some file two dot text into some dir. That works uh, fine as well. Right? If I want to move everything named file dot text into some dir, right? Then I can just type in move file star dot txt into some dir, right? And that will move all of these files into some dir. Notice that they're all gone, right? So everything that started with file and ends in text should now be in some dir, uh, and it is, and they are, sorry. So that's the move command combined with um, a path name expansion. Right, okay. Um, if you want to remove a file, uh, then you just type in rm, right? So rm is short for remove, uh, and then the uh, list of files that you would like to remove, right? So in this example here, we've got uh, three files: some file, some file one, and some file two dot text. I can remove one of those files if I want, right? um, or I can remove multiple files uh, if I want. And again, you can use a path name, uh, you can use a path name expansion here, right? So let's look at this example here, uh, and I'll show you what minus I does. Well, let me, I guess I should do both uh, so that you can see how it works. So I'm going to touch file txt file one and some file two. Right. So there are my files. Now, if you just type in uh, remove on its own, right, and press enter, uh, so it doesn't ask you if you actually want to make this change, right? It will remove the file. So if I do ls, it's gone, right? Now, when you remove something in Linux uh, or any Unix-based system, uh, there's no going back, right? It doesn't go into a recycle bin or a trash can or anything like that, right? Uh, it's gone. Uh, now. Technically, the contents are still on your disk, right? Unless it's been overwritten by something else. Um, but there's no easy way to get back a file once you've removed it. 
So you have to be a little bit careful with the uh, rm command. Uh, we can do rm sum file uh, one and sum file two. Okay. And that will remove both of those files. Right, so they're gone now. And I'm just going to recreate them with touch. Right, so there they all are. Right, and you can use a path name expansion here as well. Right, so remove sum file star. We'll remove everything right, that starts with some file. Right, so it'll remove these three files here. Gone. I'll recreate them. Uh, now, um, if you uh, if you want to uh, if you want remove to ask you, do you really want to remove this file? Uh, then you can run remove in um, interactive mode. So that's what the minus I is here. Uh, so if I do rm minus i, somehow, okay. uh, before it removes the file, it will prompt, right? Uh, do you want to remove the regular empty file, some file dot text? Right, your choices are y and n. Right? So yes, yes, and no. I'd like to keep some file two. Right? And so when you list the contents of the directory, some file one and some file are gone, but some file two is still here. Uh, so that's how that works. Um, a, a lot. I don't know if it's so. When I was an undergraduate student many, many, many years ago, um, the we so uh, our computer lab. Uh, so when I was a student, it was not that uncommon for people not to own a personal computer, right? Uh, so the department did in fact have a uh, did in fact have computer labs, and they were all Unix based. Um, so the way they would set up the um, the way they would uh, the way that our user accounts would be set up um, is that the rm command would be aliased to rm minus i. Uh, so you would always it would always ask you whether or not you wanted to remove a file um, on your computers. Uh, so if you have uh, the Windows. Uh, if you have Linux installed under Windows or if you have a Mac, RM is not aliased to minus I. So when you remove, it really will remove. Um, so if you want to, you can you can create your own alias uh, that remaps RM to RM minus I if you like. Now, because you guys have administrator privileges on your own computers, uh, it is possible for you to uh, delete operating system uh, level files. Um, you have to you have to go out of your way to do it, but it is possible to do it. So you have to be a little bit careful when you use RM. Uh, every system administrator, so that's everybody with um, uh, super user privileges, uh, has a horror story about accidentally typing RM something and deleting stuff they should not have deleted. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful about it. You can remove a directory and all of its contents. Right, so using the minus R, right? So minus R means recursively remove the directory and all of its contents. If you want to remove a directory, you have to use minus R, right? Uh, if you want to remove a directory and there's stuff in the directory, right, and you really want to remove the directory and everything that's in it, uh, you have to use minus R. There's another command called rmdir, but that only removes an empty directory. So right there. Uh, you can remove an empty directory using that command right there. Minus R will remove the directory and everything that's in it recursively, right? So if there's directories in that directory that you remove, it will also remove those directories and everything inside the subdirectories. So in some dir, sorry, right? We've got a bunch of stuff. Uh, you know what? I'm going to go into some dir and make some more directories. Make dir. I've got, uh, oh, sorry, I wanted to do that. Right, so I've got 10 subdirectories in some dir. I'm going to go up one directory. Okay, so I'm back up in uh, my XYZ directory. I'm now going to remove that directory and everything that's in it. Right, so everything that's here uh, is going to disappear. Okay. RM minus R, some dir. 
Let me run this in interactive mode so you can see what's happening. Right, like that. So should I go into the directory sumdir? Yes. Okay. Should I remove the directory sumdir four? Sure. Let's get rid of that. How about some file sumdir file nineteen? Notice that nothing is happening in any sort of sensible order, right? Uh, uh, oh, this one's a right protected at a regular file. So yes, let's get rid of that. Right. So RM will override. Uh, it will uh, ask you uh, if it should override um, the uh, uh, permissions on the file. Right. Uh, and so on, and so on. So I'm going to type Control C to stop this because I don't want to go through all of them. Right. Uh, but if I list the contents of Sumdir now, uh, you'll see that Directory Four is gone. And some of the files are gone. Right. If I don't run in interactive mode. Oh, uh, if I don't run in interactive mode and there is a write protected file, uh, RM will ask you whether or not to, over, uh, to, re, uh, to remove it. So I'm just going to remove everything. Did I really? Okay, there we go. Okay. Now you'll see that some dir is gone. Right. And all of the files and directories that were in Sumder are also gone. Um, let's see. So let me make another directory again. Okay, so Sumder is a directory. It's empty, so there's nothing in it because I just created the directory. Uh, you can use rmdir to remove an empty directory. Right, and that disappears. Again, so that uh, removes Sumder. If there's something in it, so... Make that makes a directory sumdir and it makes a subdirectory one inside of sumdir. Right? So if I use rmdir on sumdir, it'll complain it's not empty. Okay, so it won't work. Uh, so if you want to remove a directory that has stuff in it, uh, you have to use minus r. Uh, whatever you do, do not go to the root directory and type rm minus r because right, that will delete your operating system. Uh, well, it'll try to delete your operating system. Um, your in Linux or Mac, uh, I don't know what Mac will do. Uh, in Linux, it'll uh, complain that you don't own the root directory, right? Because you're probably not logged in as root um, or as a super user um, when you do that. But if you were logged in as root or super user, uh, you can go into the root directory and uh, do rm minus r. That will delete your entire operating system. Right, uh, so don't do that. Okay, copying files. Uh, so CP is the file that copies files um, and or directories. Uh, so you, it works the same way as, um, it works in a similar way as uh, move and uh, remove. Right, so if I wanna copy, I have a file called some file here, I can copy some file uh, to another file called copyfile.txt, right? And you'll now you'll now have two copies um, of the same file. Uh, copy will overwrite an existing file. So if there's already a file called copy file, uh, then copy will overwrite the existing file. So uh, we have some file. Well, I've got some file too here. So let me copy that. Uh, onto something else, onto copy. Now you can see that uh, there's that file there and there's that file there. Um, now it actually makes a copy of the contents. So I'm just going to quickly edit some file too. And so if I copy that again, uh, if I ask or if I print the contents of some file too, you can see it's A, B, C, D, E. If I print the contents of copy uh, dot text, it's also A, B, C, D, E. They are independent copies. So if I edit some file too, so like that. Right. Uh, so some file, I've deleted the first three lines of some file too. Uh, the copy doesn't change. 
right? So they are in fact independent copies. Uh, you can move, uh, sorry, you can copy a file into another directory as well. So I can copy some file two into uh, some dir. Um, and I can give it a new name if I want to. Uh, if I don't, right, so if I just list a directory name, um, it'll create a uh, second file in some dir that has the same name as the copied file. So in Sumder, I now have a copy of the file sumfile2.txt, right? And they are identical. Uh, their contents are identical. So there's the one in the current directory, and there is the one, and there's the copied one. Right? So their contents are identical. The destination name doesn't have to be the same. I can copy some file two dot text into some dir and give it then give the copy a new name. So I can give it the name copy dot text, and inside the directory some dir is now um, a file called copy dot text, whose contents are the same as uh, that file there. Uh, if you want to copy a directory and all of its contents, you use minus r to do a recursive uh, copy. Okay, so that will recursively copy the contents of some dir, right? uh, and, in, and it'll make uh, into a new directory called copy dir. Okay, so here's some dir. Okay, I wanna make a, a copy of that directory and all of its contents, and I want to call the copy copy to dir. So I just cp minus r, under and copied. Let me call it like that. Right, like that. Copy dir. Right, there's some dir. If I list the comp, uh, sorry, if I list the contents of both the directories, like that. Right, you can see they're identical. So copy dir has a directory called one, it's got these two files in it. Some dir has a uh, directory one, and it's got these two files in it. These are all independent copies, right? So copy dir copy.txt is an is a independent file, uh, is independent from the file some dir copy.txt, right? So they are two independent uh, copies. That's um, the basics of manipulating files, right? So to make a file, you can use touch uh, if you want to. You don't have to, right? So there's lots of ways to create a file. If you want to make a if you want to make a new empty file with a certain name, you can use touch if you want to. Um, to print the contents of a text file, you can use cat, right? C A T. Uh, to remove something, it's R M. To copy something, it's C P. And to uh, what was the other one? Move, copy, sorry, uh, move, oh, rename. Uh, yeah, so to, to move or rename, it's MV. To remove, sorry, to move or rename, it's MV. To remove, it's just RM, and to copy, it's CP. Okay. Um, so, that's the basics of working on the command line. Now, obviously, there's many, 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 many other commands um, that we haven't uh, that uh, that exist, right? Um, what we want to do now is we want to write little programs that run in the uh, shell, right? So these are these programs are called uh, scripts. Um, so a shell script. Uh, is just a plain text file containing a sequence of commands, right? So everything that I've been showing you um, by typing in stuff directly at the command line, uh, you could uh, say you could type those into a text file and save uh, the text file, right? uh, and then you can use uh, the then you can rerun the commands from the text file um, by having an interpreter uh, read the text file. So uh, the shell reads the file and executes the commands in the file. Shell is both a command line interface, 
right? So in other words, you can type stuff into the um, prompt um, and the shell can interpret it. Uh, so, uh, right, and, and the shell can interpret what you, um, and the shell can also interpret the contents of a file. So when you create a script, um, it has to be readable and executable. Right? Uh, so if you want to run the script as a program, right, you need read permission on that script and you need execute permission on that script. Now, when you know, when you create a file, right, so I'm going to create a script called, I don't know, something about script. So touch. Uh, uh, most uh, bash, um, uh, it's common to see the extension .sh on a shell script. Uh, it's not universal, but it, it's pretty common. So I'm going to make this uh, file called example.sh that I want to use as a shell script. Right. Now, when I list, sorry, uh, the permissions on this shell script, right, you can see that I have read permission on it, I have write permission on it, but I don't have execute permission on it. So I can't run that. Uh, I cannot use this um, in its current form. I can't use example.sh uh, as a shell script, as a runnable shell script. Okay. So you have to remember to add execute permission uh, to the script. Okay. And now, uh, I will be able to, uh, I can at least attempt to run this as a shell script. Right? I can't actually do that yet because there's nothing in it. Right? So don't forget, right? So to save, uh, after you've saved your file or edited your, your script file, you have to enable the execute permission on it before you can run it. Um, let's see. So there are some, uh, I mean, these aren't universal either. There are some uh, rules for naming scripts. Uh, there's some style rules for naming scripts. Uh, these are not at all universal. Uh, people are free to name. People are free to name their scripts however they want, and they do. Right? Um, it's usually though you should start your script with a lowercase letter. Uh, you should try to only use um, letters and numbers and the underscore in your script names. Right? So you should avoid unusual characters. One of the reasons you should avoid using unusual characters is because you want to avoid having to escape them, right? So whatever you do, don't put like a star or a question mark in your um, in your file names, right? Because those are interpreted. Remember that your shell will try to interpret those as wildcards. Uh, if you have a multi-word script name, you can use an underscore to separate the words if you want. Uh, not everybody does that. Uh, let's make a hello world in Bash as a Bash script. So uh, this is exactly what Hello World looks like in Bash, right? This is one, uh, well, one version of it anyway, right? Um, so the echo command, right? Remember, echo that just prints whatever string you tell it to print. I want to print the string Hello World, so it's inside of single quotes. Four double quotes would be fine here. Uh, in this example, you don't even need the quotes; it'll still work. Um, but I'm quoting the string to indicate that that's one string. You need this funny thing up here, right? So you need uh, the hashtag or the pound sign followed by the question mark, right? So that's the um, hash bang, sometimes called shebang. Um, that thing there, right? So those two characters there, that instructs the shell to use that program here to interpret the contents of the file. That's basically, so when you type in the command, dot hello dot sh, right? Uh, the shell starts to read the script, right? It sees on the first line, uh, this directive here, right? So it's going to use that program there to interpret or to run the contents of the file. Bash bin bash, that's the bash shell. Uh, that's the standard location of the bash shell. Uh, so this script will be executed using the bash shell. You can specify, there's lots of other interpret. This thing here is called the interpreter, right? So this is the program that will interpret the contents of the file. 
Uh, there are many shells available to you on Linux and on Mac, right? Uh, so you can change the interpreter. For this course, though, you should always use Bash, right? Because we're assuming uh, the Bash programming language here. Uh, okay, so let's make this file. I want to, oh, I should show you how to do this. So on Mac, right, you just pull up whatever file, whatever text editor you have on Mac, right? Uh, so uh, I'm not sure, like everybody's probably using a different one. Um, on Windows, uh, if you've got your terminal open here, so if you're on Windows 10, right, not on Windows 11, if you're in Windows 10, um, all you have is this command prompt. Right? You don't actually have a graphical user desktop for your, uh, or you don't have access to uh, graphical user interfaces, uh, graphical programs, right? or programs that use a graphical user interface from uh, in Windows, uh, from the Linux prompt. If you have Windows 11 uh, installed, uh, then it's possible to run um, some Linux applications, uh, some graphical Linux applications. Right. So there you would just start up whatever editor you want. Uh, if you're in Windows 10 and you have Visual Studio Code installed, uh, Code knows how to talk to your uh, Linux operating system. Right. Uh, so if you have that, if you have Lin uh, Code installed, then you can just run Code via Code uh, and then the file name. Uh, you don't need the ampersand here. Uh, so if I press Enter here, this is going to start up uh, Visual Studio Code. Uh, and it's going to start it up in the uh, inside the Linux. Uh, well, it's going to save the files in the Linux operating system, right? So it won't save it under your Windows file system. Okay, so that's how you start code uh, from the command line in Linux, right? When you're doing your assignments or if you're doing any sort of practice work in this course, right, you should open up uh, your Linux installation and then start code from inside the Linux installation, right? Don't start code from your um, start prompt, uh, from the start menu in Windows, right? Start it from inside of, uh, start it from Linux via the command line. Okay, so I want to type in the contents of this file into here. So, bin bash. And then I want to echo, like that. That's it, you save it. Um, and did I change the permission? Yeah, I already changed the permissions on it. Um, so even if you, uh, so if you save the file in your editor, the, f the editor does not change the permissions for you, right? Uh, code knows that this is a, a shell script, right? That's why I have the syntax highlighting here. Uh, down here, you can see as well, right? So down here, it says that code knows it's a shell script, uh, but the, but uh, code will not, save it uh, with the execute permission on. Right, so don't forget to change the permissions, right? So set permissions of the file. Now to run the file, there's example.shell. Right, to run the file, you probably have to type dot slash. This is true in Mac as well, right? So you have to type in dot slash example.sh, right? When I run that, not surprisingly, you get hello world. Right, so dot slash name of the file. And I'm going to explain why you have to do that in a second. Right, so why do I have to write that? Uh, so the problem is when you run a program uh, from the command line, uh, the uh, shell needs to know where is this program coming from, right? So it needs to know what is the location of this program because it's an executable. Because uh, when you type in a command, um, the shell, uh, so when you type it, yeah. So when you type something into the command uh, into a into the um, command prompt, the shell thinks it's a command. Right? Now the question is, is where does the shell look for commands? Right. So, so somewhat surprisingly, it does not necessarily look at your current directory for commands. Right. So back here, right. My current working directory is home Burton X Y Z. Right. If I just type in example.sh, it says, hey, this command's not found, right? I don't know where example.sh is, right? Even though the file is sitting right here, right? The way that uh, Unix-like operating systems look for commands um, is it searches a list of directories, right? So there's certain directories 
that the operating system knows about or that the shell knows about um, where it thinks uh, it can, where uh, it looks for commands, right? So the list of directories is stored in this environment variable called path. So you can see that very long list of directories um, is where um, my shell will look for um, uh, executable programs, right? So you can see it's going to look in this directory called home Burton bin. Right? The colon separates directory entries. Uh, so it's also going to look in user local s bin, user local bin, and many, 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 many other directories, right? There's a whole bunch of them here. Right. You probably won't. You you probably have a very different set of directories when you do this. Um, but what's not listed here is the directory Holbert and XYZ. Right. So that's not there. So that means uh, so when you try to run example.shell as a program, that's why it complains. Command's not found. Right. Uh, so you can tell it where the command is by prefixing the command name with the directory name, right? Or with a path name, right? So dot is the current directory, right? So dot slash example dot sh means look in the current directory for the execute, executable program command example dot sh. If you want to, uh, so that's using a relative path, right? So dot is relative to the current directory, dot means the current directory, Right, so dot example dot sh means look in the current directory. Uh, if you want to, you can use an absolute path. Right? So I can use that instead. Uh, so that also works. Right? Um, no matter how you do it, though, uh, the shell needs to know where is this executable program. Right? If it's located in a directory that's not on the path, you have to tell it where it is, right? Either using a relative path or an absolute path like this, right? Um, you should probably generally avoid absolute paths uh, because um, that uh, if you use an absolute path, it's not portable, uh, right? Because if you try to run this on someone else's computer, it's probably not going to be <coughs> in that directory there. It'll probably be somewhere else. Uh, there's the other way to print path. Right, so this is another way to do it. Um, so I can use the echo program. Now, remember from the previous lecture, uh, I told you about a um, about the um, expansions, right? That's an example of an expansion, right? So path is a variable name that the shell knows about, right? Dollar sign braces, variable name inside the uh, dollar sign, will substitute the value of that variable uh, for all of this, right? So what's the value of the variable? Well, the value of the variable is that string there, right? So it echoes that string there. Right? So whatever the value of the path is gets substituted for all of this. Um, print environment also works, right? So uh, that one also works. OK, uh, you can temporarily update your path to include a new directory if you want to. Right? Uh, now, temporarily means as long as your current shell stays open, right? that's how long the change will um, stay for. Right? So if I wanted to, Right. So for the purposes of today's lecture, since I'm doing everything in X, Y, Z, right? If I wanted to, I could add X, Y, Z to the path, right? So the way you do that is use export. What am I going to do? What's this going to do here? So path equals dollar path. Right, so let's type that in. OK, so this works exactly the same way as how I just explained it, right? So that's an expansion, right? So the value of path gets substituted into here, right? So this string gets substituted here, right? Uh, col oh, sorry, colon, 
So I'm going to call in. Uh, and now I'm just going to type in the full path name. Right? So I'm going to type in home, Burton X, uh, XYZ. Right. Uh, so remember in the path, in the list of uh, directories in the path, the colon is used as the separator, uh, as the directory separator. So that expansion gives you all of this. Right. And then colon. Homebert and XYZ is going to stick colon Homebert and XYZ to the end of the string. And then it's going to take all of this and assign it back to the variable path. Okay. So when I type in that, and then I do print environment. You can see at the end of the path is now that directory. All right now I can just type in example uh, like that. Right, and now it works. Right, if I close this shell, that's no longer there, right? So that's why I say, if you want to temporarily do this, uh, you can uh, you can do this, right? So if you're working on an assignment or something, uh, and you get tired of uh, typing in dot blah every time, then you can update your path. Probably easier to just to type in dot blah. Um, now that doesn't always work, so sometimes you do want to update your path because um, you might get an assignment where uh, you need to run a shell script that's in another directory um, or something like that, right? Or you need to uh, you need to change to a certain directory, but you still want to run a script uh, that's in your assignment directory. Uh, now, if you want to set up, uh, so you you can change you can make the change. Um, not per, well, you can make the change so that every time you open up a, a shell, uh, your path contains um, a particular directory. Right. So if you want to do that, you can update the file or you can create the file dot bash profile in your home directory uh, so that it includes uh, a path. Uh, so that it updates the path and adds the directory of your choosing. Right. So for example, if you wanted to put all of your scripts into a directory called sys220 slash bin, right? Where sys220 is in your home directory, right? You can add this line to your bash profile. Um, and every time you open up uh, a bash shell, right? Uh, that directory will be added to your path, right? It'll be part of your path. That way that lets you, that lets you put all your shell scripts into this one directory. So for example, I think mine's already updated. I list everything, right, including the hidden files. You can see I've just got a bunch of junk here. Uh, do I have a bash profile? I don't. I have a bash RC. Uh, um, so we can do that. Uh, so if you want to, you can make that file dot bash profile. Uh, so you do something like touch dot bash profile. And then you would edit it. So I'm just going to use code to edit it. The problem with this. Um, the problem with this is that uh, it's going to. Uh, if you do this, you're probably going to lose. The uh, coloring on your LS command. But I'll uh, I'll I'll post a note on how to deal with that in a second. All right. So in your bash profile, you can just add this line. Uh, so. And then, so you can call this whatever you want, right? Wherever your sys220 directory is, uh, just put in uh, that directory name, right? So this says my home directory, sys220, right? I'm going to make a directory called bin, uh, or I'm going to say, uh, uh, let's uh, uh, add the bin directory uh, to the path. Save this. Right. Back here. Right. There's bash profile. Right. Uh, there's the contents of bash profile. Right. So update the path. Right. Now, if I close this shell, 
uh, or if I close this Ubuntu session and open it up again and I go type out the path, it, you'll see that that directory is part of the path. Okay, so if you want to, uh, you can do that as well. All right. Um, what time is it? It's almost 20 after. Okay, so with the uh, if you want to comment in a script, uh, with the exception of the first line, right? So on the first line, that uh, the hashtag has to be there, right? The pound sign has to be there. On every other line, uh, the pound sign or the hashtag symbol is the same as um, slash slash in Java, right? So it's a line ending comment. Um, the uh, pound followed by the exclamation mark. I already told you what that was, right? So that tells the kernel to use whatever is here uh, to interpret the rest of the script. Um, sorry, I just want to quickly look how much more of this lecture is here. Okay, I think we should probably stop there today um, since we're almost out of time anyway. Um, so we'll pick this up from command line arguments next day. I've uh, got a little bit of time if anybody has any questions. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, uh, so we'll call it a day there, and um, I will see you uh, in a couple of days. <laughs>